What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Yair Attar of Otario.com, and you can they, they protect everything you operate, right? Okay, so cybersecurity solutions, we're going to go into it, what they do. But yeah, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. And because this is part of my top Israel business leader series, um, there's a really good one I did with Moise Navone of Mobileye, who was one of the founding engineers. Um, and they talked about the journey of being acquired by Intel for $15.3 billion. So it was a, it was a pretty crazy journey. I had also a uh, fellow EO Israel member of Yair, uh, Arit Oz. She's run an agency for over 25 years in the B2B space, helping companies with global expansion. I had EO Israel member Amit Estrecher of Extras and Genie talk about how he lost all of his clients overnight, not once, but twice. Crazy journey and how he bounced back. Uh, Nir Zavaro wrote, uh, fuck the slides, excuse my French. Uh, and he talked about storytelling and branding. Um, and Ron Gave, a founder of webs.io, um, helping protect brands from the dark web and brand protection and, and many more. So check those out on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. Uh, Rise 25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships. Um, and we do that by helping you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. And we do the strategy, the accountability, and the full execution. Yeah, here we call ourselves the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company to create great content and great, great relationships. You know, for me, uh, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I've found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com to learn more. I am excited to introduce Yair Atari. He's the CTO and co-founder at Otario, which is a cyber physical system, cybersecurity company. And they help organizations with a safe and secure digitalization journey. And Prior to Otario, we'll call it, we'll say Major Atar led the Israeli Defense Force Incident Response and Threat Hunting Cybersecurity Divisions. He has over 15 years of experience in cybersecurity software, engineering, risk management, with a focus on protecting industrial and critical infrastructure from cyber threats. So, Nir, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. So, talk about how did you get on this journey? to help protect people from this industrial and critical infrastructure from cyber threats? Okay. So um, first, like on my personal journey, I started um, as a software engineer within the Israel Defense Forces. And I really had the honor and opportunity to do various positions and which led to my uh, previous role, which was, as you mentioned, leading Israel nation state incident response and threat hunting um, units. And as we know, unfortunately, Israel uh, has a lot of attention uh, <laughs> towards us. So I think cybersecurity domain is something that you learn best from experience. This is one of the reasons why Israel is such a, um, from a cybersecurity perspective, such a, a strong nation. Uh, we learn um, at a very young age. And um, I think also the Israeli Defense Forces um, is a great melting point from uh, melting pot, sorry, from from like society perspective, right? Because you get people that are being screened from the whole society and, and population of Israel, and you get this um, culture that's developed at a very young age that you can do everything. Right, I remember even uh, situations with with my own soldiers that something needs to be done by I don't know it's end of week and for for beginning of week and like the the, the soldier never did it before and he's telling me like I have no clue and I'm like 
okay, I mean, dude, I don't care, make it happen, right? So you develop like, and, and you're successful one time after another, and you develop this mentality like that everything is possible. And I think, by the way, this is one what, what, something that also leads to like this, what we call startup nation and things like that, because at a very young age, and then you go out from the, the uh, Israeli Defense Forces with this type of mentality and you believe in yourself and you start building things. And I also think that something that, um, you know, uh, about me in general, but I think also um, represents to some extent the, the Israel uh, philosophy about things, we're small, but we're agile and we fast and we adapt and we understand. And I think to, in order to win or in, in a lot of areas in life, you need to be able to do that. I even have, like, for example, one of the things that uh, I had the opportunity, and this was in the newspaper, so I can talk about it. But before I finished my military service, there was sort of like a capture the flag, a uh, multinational exercise being led by Israel and um, the Cyber Command and the NSA. And I won't forget the moment where, you know, I brought like, I led the Israeli blue team, and I brought like, I don't know, around 20. Uh, young soldiers that from different like areas within the um, army, like from from sorry from like the army, from the navy, from the air force, and whatever that didn't even work with each other before. Um, and then I get a tour to the U.S. side, and I get to a huge hall with like two hundred people, and everyone are so experts at what they do, like they did it for many years and i'm like getting back to my room with my team i'm like thinking to myself oh shit no way we're it's gonna intimidating win. no way and but i i can't show it right so so i'm telling to my team we're gonna win this we're gonna take it and whatever the exercise starts and then i then i get it you know we we huddle up we we say this is what needs to be done everyone knows what they need to do go do it you trust each other you there's accountability and there's no need for additional approvals or additional processes, which are important when you're a big organization, but when you're small and you want to move fast, it just don't work. So I think this is what really helped us. Uh, and then we won. Um, but this is really what, what clicked my mind that one of our uniqueness is that we are first learners and we can adjust and build fast things to make it a win wherever we are. And I think this is something that then uh, when I finished my military service, so um, I went and opened Otorio and I had also the opportunity with the experience I got to meet my co-founder, uh, Danny Bran, um, which he established the Cyber Defense Command in the Israel Defense Forces. So he was a big name and we started our journey together and I think it was a very good match both from personal and and professional perspective and what we understood and i think there were some events throughout our service that led us to the understanding what risk management is all about and i think there was like um one time there was uh, and i won't share the, the, the full details but let me just say that there were two systems one is the mailing service and you know everyone are in, impacted it's not working and uh you get the chief of staff office calling immediately right this needs to be fixed now and then in parallel there's a critical system operational system that is not working and nobody noticed and by luck we didn't need it specifically at that time but it was only by luck and the whole organization was focused on the mailing service. And I think this is what led us to the understanding that there's, there's a need for non-experts, not for cybersecurity or IT or technical people, for business stakeholders to understand what the digital risks and how they reflect on the operational business. So when we went to the commercial, to um, uh, basically to do the outside world and, and start seeing the market, it was clear that we want to do something in, in cybersecurity and risk management. And we saw what's happening in the 
operational side. It's not just industrial because today everything is becoming more connected. We're talking about from smart warehouses and logistics and cameras and buildings. And so everything is becoming more and more connected that there was a solution that in the market back then there were like multiple companies, but they were doing more of the same, which is a detecting of a threat when the attacker is within the network. Now, this was based on a novel, you could say, right? In, in uh, about like 13 years ago, there was like a major event called Stuxnet that uh, maybe we'll get back to it, but basically um, this was one of the first times and it had a lot of, um, um, I would say echo around it, that a nation was able with code to affect a physical process. In this case, it was an Iranian uh, nuclear facility enriching uranium for building an atom bomb. And basically with code that was written somewhere in the world was able to affect and actually stop and or reduce the creation of centrifuges. And this caused like every, everyone to understand, okay, oh no, like something like this can happen to us. Since then, I think the whole market evolved significantly. So whoever was behind that was trying to stall the manufacturing of nuclear weapons. Correct. But one of the challenges with that is that once it was published, it became an open source. So think about it now, you have such a weapon that any hacker with, it doesn't need to be an expert, can start using and target other types of organizations. And, and the whole, this, this whole threat landscape is just changing and evolving. Another just example is that during COVID, there was a new marketplace called RAS, Ransomware as a Service. You get to the dark web, you ask, I want you to go and run some of this company and I offer five Bitcoins or whatever, some specific amount of money. And someone jumps and say, I can do that. And all of a sudden you have a platform, a marketplace for basically targeting different entities and organizations around the, in the world creating impact. And, and, and what we start seeing is that also impact on operations, impact on physical operations is happening. And I think to some extent, what led us to the understanding again, that as I mentioned before, from a risk management perspective, right, is that our market needs to be able to manage this risk proactively. There's a lot of today, trends around industry 4.0 from predictive maintenance and, and, and basically doing more with less. So thinking about this concept, just from a cybersecurity and digital risks perspective, how can I proactively take actions that will reduce the potential of my organization being impacted? And unfortunately today, every other week, you hear this, um, thing happening. And one last thing, which was very helpful for our journey, that actually really helped us to boost our journey to some extent, we met an industrialist, we met someone that um, has a vision of autonomous manufacturing. And this man, um, Dr. Wolfgang Leitner, which is the majority stakeholder of a company named Andritz, which they are an industrial engineering global company, um, which they, what they do is they basically build plants, machineries uh, for different types of industries. Every time they went to talk to customers of them, they, like, they said, okay, this is a great idea, but what do you do about cybersecurity? This is when he understood that he needs to do something about cybersecurity. And we partnered with them at the beginning of 2018, where basically together we established Autorio to serve also them as a customer and also leverage them as a partner to their end customers. But also, of course, we are working uh, directly with today 
many global organizations everywhere. Uh, but this really helped us to boost our reach to the market and also our understanding of what does it mean a manufacturing site operations, working with automation engineers and helping us really to build a solution that really fits those complex use cases because one of the challenges as well, and today the IT security space is very well established. Everyone knows exactly there's a very clear understanding what needs to be done, what type of solutions out there that are needed, et cetera. This space, OT, cyber CPS or cyber physical systems, like different names, but is still evolving, is still maturing. And a lot of organizations don't always have the understanding what they need to do. And sometimes even you see clash of different cultures and uh, within an organization, IT security teams and operational members that didn't talk to one another for a very long time, you know, blue colors, white colors. And this now with the digitalization causes them that they need to start talking together because things are being connected to the cloud and sensors and whatever and IoT and IIoT. And this is what's happening in the market. So this is in a nutshell, our journey. Yeah, so the OT side is is basically operational technology and protecting, and I know you work with a lot of manufacturers. Um, there was, um, and attacks like this can cause chaos. You know, digital or uh, cyber attacks can cause real physical issues. Um, and there was something that happened with, um, there was no gas in certain areas. What happened with that? Yeah, so I think this is a good example. So a few years ago, um, there was a cyber attack. I think one of the um, um, attacks that caused uh, significant damage in the U.S. on the Colonial Pipeline Company, which basically have uh, gas pipelines and distribute, at the end of the day, gas to different places. And um, due to a cyber attack, they stopped their operations for about a week. And this caused like panic in many places because there was no gas in gas stations and things like that. And, and what was interesting with the, this use case is that what's known today is that there was an attacker that reached the IT organization, but because they could, they, they took a decision. They took a decision to stop operations because think about it, if there, you have an attacker within your pipelines, it can actually cause much more damage from explosions to stopping things and et cetera. So safety related, environment, environmental related. So they took a decision to drop everything down and stop operations. And if they had a chance to understand, they really had the visibility of how the environment is secured and how hard it is to actually cause this type of damage, maybe they could have taken a different approach or decision. So this is just one example. And unfortunately, again, we hear almost um, every week now, uh, there's a big one that was happening uh, a few months ago. Uh, Colorex company, the one responsible for manufacturing of like different um, uh, cleaning materials and things like that. Uh, we're talking about they're now reporting their Q1, you know, uh, some of their uh, revenues within the last quarters. And we're talking about more than $300 million losses. And this is what at least we know. One of the challenges also- in What this happened market, with it? So, so actually quite similar to some extent to, to um, Colonial Pipeline, where basically they were got hit. Um, again, when you don't have proper visibility into your digital operational environments and how well they are connected and, and, and you are immediately afraid. And so they also took a decision in some places to just stop operations. And unfortunately, by the way, think about it. When you have materials that sometimes, you know, are they serve pharmaceutical, for example, whatever. So they are regulated. If the operational process stops, then you need to stop everything, clean everything, and do everything from, from the beginning. And, and this is just one use case within the pharmaceutical and, and food, but also food beverages and things like that. So it, the whole operations become much more complex, much more digitalized. And again, over there, they just stopped operations because of this attack. 
cause this significant impact. So from an Ontario perspective, what would you have done or what would have been in place that would allow them to maybe do something differently? So I think that today, um, one of, so, so first of all, what we're seeing here is almost as a pattern that the most significant and scarier attacks are ransomwares because it's the easiest, to some extent, the easiest um, attack, like you don't need to invest a lot. Once you're, you you got one foothold within the organization, it basically it spreads and it causes the most significant impact on those types of environments and those types of organizations. And, and what we do, which is quite different today with what we're seeing in the market, is we're helping those organizations to understand proactively where are those gaps. And one of the challenges in general in cybersecurity is that you're, when you see everything, you're, you're overwhelmed because you're not an expert always and you don't know where to start and you don't know what decisions to take that will create the most significant impact from a risk reduction perspective. So what we've built, we have a solution that basically helps to take them to this journey. And it's a journey, by the way, that we, we accompany them throughout this journey. And we just it, it's not just, here's the product or technology, and that's it, and, and, and goodbye, and talk to us when you're new. But it really is a journey that we work with them to help them build the workflows and processes around it. Because again, this is still maturing and, and evolving. But at the end of the day, it really helps them to take the best call to action and leverage already compensation controls they, they invested in the past and hopefully do more with less. Because again, we know that you know one of the some of the biggest challenges in, in general, but in cybersecurity specifically, is manpower, skill set, and especially, you know, those sophisticated people will not always go and work for, I don't know, an energy utility. They will go to work for other IT or advanced technology companies. So we know that we address a market where there's not a lot of people over there dealing with this. And there's not always the skill set. And we need to help basically support them, upskill them, and accompany them in this journey. And then they help them be protected. When do you get a call? Because, I mean, I look at the spectrum of being super proactive and being super reactive. And I don't know, my thoughts skew to people are calling because they're attacked. But when do people actually call you? Yeah, so definitely today, still the best driver for companies to start moving the needle is either being attacked or their direct competition or someone they know from close has been attacked. This is where, because unfortunately, you know, there's this saying, you know, it, it works, so don't do anything. And uh, people tend to, it's like sometimes like insurance, right? You uh, Sometimes you need to pay or you need to do the minimum just to comply or whatever, and you get the things when, when, when something happens. So people think about it that way sometimes, but this is changing. So I would say we, of course, definitely will always get a, a, a more um, alarming call when something happens. But our goal is to educate and work with our customers not to get there, right? To hopefully get to the point, because let, let me give an analogy. Cybersecurity in general, right? It's it's like a rotating wheel. You're, everything is changing all the time from defend, both from defender perspective and attacker perspective. They get better tools, they get, they are agile, they are changing things and defend needs to be changed as well. And I think I usually, I usually use this analogy of Think about two men that are in the field and they see danger. Let's say a lion. One goes down to tie his shoes. The other one tells him, what are you doing? Like, he's going to chase us anyway. But then he tells him, that's okay. I only need to outrun you. So basically, right, the, the whole thing about it is that I don't think anyone needs to be perfect. 
I don't think anyone needs to do everything everywhere. It doesn't make sense. But you need to start doing some things and you need to start protecting your environment a bit better than others because attackers are also human beings. Like everyone else, they like to do, um, they like to work less, but still do more. So if it will be one company that is trying to attack, it will just be too hard. They will go to the next one. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. It's probably similar to, let's just say someone's going to rob houses, right? And they see one with a big sign. We have an alarm system and we have a dog and we have all the stuff, you know, and they can go to another house that doesn't have all that stuff. You know, it, it's obviously going to be an easier, easier task. And that's kind of what you're saying in this case. Yeah, and, and and also that um those um you know danger signs or whatever is definitely uh something that helps, but then you have the more sophisticated that will still try to get in, right? But you need to make sure that you're doing the the I would say um some hygiene, right? Making sure that your door is locked and making sure that the windows are locked and things like that. Because at the end of the day, sometimes we also see a lot of organizations that you know puts and let, let's use this analogy on the door, like cameras and everything and making sure, et cetera. But then there's a window behind that is widely open. So it's also really knowing the whole terrain of your house in this analogy and understanding where it might come from. And based on that, doing what we call risk management, right? Prioritizing and things like that. But yes, if you do those, let's say even basic things, definitely more, makes more sense that someone will just go to the next target. What are some, you mentioned, you know, looking at everything holistically, what are some mistakes that you've seen companies uh, they were making that maybe seemed obvious to you, but weren't, weren't to them? Um, I think in this space, unfortunately, almost everything. Cause it, it, we're really getting to basics sometimes. Cause think like about what it. would you consider basics? So thinking just from proper segmentation, so segregating between different networks or things related to user management or authentication or et cetera, because think about it and it's nobody to blame because those environments were built with the mindset that they are air gapped, that they are separated. But what happened with digitalization, everything became connected. Because if you're not digitalized, you're going to go back from, see, from just costs, revenues, et cetera, right? Against your competition. So those environments, to some extent, were built insecure by design. But they were not built to be connected. And sometimes you have people that have been responsible for those for many years, and they are great at what they do. Great operational teams, automation engineers, but again, they didn't always have the full understanding of what does it mean to do it also secure. And this is what we're seeing today within the market. And, and again, also what we're seeing is, as I mentioned before, CISOs, the cybersecurity officers are taking responsibility because at the end, as a board, I want you know someone who wakes up and go to sleep thinking about cybersecurity. But the thing is that up until yesterday, he's he's been told this is not your domain, don't touch. And all of a sudden, he's been tasked with this responsibility. But when he goes to the operational teams, it's not always that smooth and easy. There's really a need for, and by the way, it's it's not to blame them because I think what we saw in the past that. IT folks came with their own solutions and approaches. And what they did, they ran things in operational environments and they caused things to break. Because what we see today, what I think there's already an understanding today that IT security as it is, doesn't fit OT security. Because again, you have very sensitive assets. They were not built with the mechanisms like in IT to protect them. So they just break and collapse and stop working. And at the end of the day, if this, you know, affects operations and cause uh, production stop, nobody wants that. And that's a significant impact. 
talk about you know from from a leadership perspective um what you've learned uh from your your co-founder yeah so i think is um definitely one of the most uh, strategic people i've ever seen you know he gets to a room he really reads everyone understand what's happening and um how to you know, he used to, to say to me uh, that sometimes uh, he plays uh, um, multidimensional chess. So it's not just what you see on the board and all the, you know, the um, um, entities that are on the board itself, but also who's looking, what's they're thinking, and what's they're going to play, what's going to be in the next move. So I think really from a strategic perspective, is one of the best leaders I ever met. Um, of course, also what I always liked, even when he uh, was a general in the military, that he didn't care about getting his hands dirty. And when something needs to be done, just go up to the last person, get the details, understand what's happening, and go and fix it. And not just asking other managers other officers um that that are within his unit to go and fix it etc but really some things that are critical just make them happen so those are things that i've seen and i've learned and i think it's something amazing that i've learned a lot from you know we talked about some of the attacks that can cause chaos um, and I understand, you know, you help a lot of people in automotive manufacturing, um, there's pulp and paper, there's food and beverage, pharmaceuticals. Can you walk through a little bit, um, take, for example, like a medical manufacturer and what kind of, uh, what do you do for, for someone like that? Yeah. So think about it. Like when, when the solution is deployed, the first thing you basically get to do, get to see, is um, the whole like visibility of what's happening in the environment, like what assets, how they are connected, um, where they are located, to what business units they serve. Because at the end of the day, in, um, I would say, operational environments, right, not all assets were born equal. I might have same digital assets, same, let's say, um, controller, a sensor that has the same vulnerabilities, the same gaps and exposures, but they serve different purposes. One is for a critical process and another one is for less. So adding this context, this contextualized visibility, this is the first step of our customers. They understand what they have, they understand where it is, they understand their gaps and exposures. And this is the first step that our platform takes them. Now, the second step is by integrating with their compensation controls, we assess how much they are effective. So think about it that I'm as a company, I invested in firewalls and endpoint protection and et cetera, but it could be that they're not configured to the maximum, especially what we see in those types of environments. It's not always managed properly because again, people processes things like that. So we find those, what we call evidence-based gaps from a segmentation, from assets that are not covered by different controls, from a policy gaps perspective. And then what our solution is doing is take all the findings, all the network connectivity, how everything connects to one another, creates this, what we call a cyber digital twin or a sandbox environment, where it then simulates attacks in a non-intrusive way. So understanding what an attacker can do, in order to prior, and this is why, by the way, something we have a patent in in the states on, and understand what is actually exploitable, what attacker can actually do, which identifying the easiest vectors, and based on that, prioritize for the company what's the best call to action, what action items they can actually do. Like it really shows you the actual steps you need to do to start reducing the risk. So what, once everything like this is going in an ongoing process, I would say, the company can start implementing processes. So if they're starting to take actions, mitigation actions in maintenance routines or different types of aspects, how it 
um, basically fit the company. And they're starting proactively to manage and reduce the risk. So this is usually the journey that our platform takes them. Uh, we're then, again, we accompany that with helping them build the right workflows, the right processes, and, and who needs to do what. Because again, sometimes those are new people, new technologies, new environments, new responsibilities. They need help. Talk about growing through partnerships. And what have you done with the company that has helped you grow through partnerships? Um, so I think at the end of the day, in order for a company to scale, it cannot do it by itself. And this is where partners plays a key strategy. Because today, I mean, who knows about Authorio, right? We're small, we're started from Israel. When someone in the States or in Europe or in any other place, um, they're not always aware of who we are or the solutions that are out there and things like that. So yes, there is this you know, direct approach when we're targeting and creating marketing and everything else, but this is just in a too small scale. In order to grow a company and scale it, you need to start multiply that much faster. And the reason and, and, and the way to do it is through partners, especially by the way, cybersecurity is considered um, a trust topic. So a lot of companies out there already have those trusted advisors, those companies that they work with, that they establish relationship with, that help them with this journey in their IT space or whatever, whether those are large managed security service providers, whether those are global system integrators, whether those are resellers, whether those are individual contributors. So different types of uh, entities that exist that basically once I am establishing a good relationship with those types of entities, they help me to scale because they have 10, 15, 100, few hundred of customers that are my target customers and they have the reach out. So this is a key strategy of, of I think, any cybersecurity company, but, us, but of course ours as well. In order to scale our business, we work a lot with partners. And I think what we also saw, which is interesting, I think this is something more specifically for the OT space, is that the whole um, service organizations out there are also learning and adjusting and evolving. Because again, this whole market is still, still growing. And we're seeing different types of um, providers. Some that come, like Andritz, comes from the industrial or engineering background. And they have the trust of the operational teams on site, where sometimes you have cybersecurity providers that they are the trusted advisors for the CISO teams. So I think everyone finds this market growing. So we know everyone wants a bite. Uh, what we saw that really makes things successful is that, uh, especially at our, at our stage, I think that also there's a, there's a different, what we call stage appropriate, to which partners you want to go. Because the big ones, I'm too small fish for them. They don't want to work hard. They want someone It's very repetitive, like, it's easy to scale and without a lot of heavy lifting. At the beginning, when you're a disruptive solution like we are, in still evolving and changing market that there's still a lot of unknowns and, and uncertainty, we're mainly looking for those um, early adopters or types of um, the ones that really drive through innovation or are smaller, sometimes even regional partners that are more eager for success, that are more hungry for success. And also we understood that we are limited from the resources that we can invest. And this is an investment from our side as well, to educate, to train, to enable, to work with them, to shadow them until they are enabled. And that's a heavy lift. So at the end of the day, yes, I think partners is a key strategy for scaling a business. But in our area, first, we need to really choose wisely. 
because just having a big list of partners, that's easy. You need to have a few that are actually successful. And for them to be successful, you need to invest and make them successful so everyone gets successful. Yeah, I want to talk about, you know, surrounding ourselves with groups of people that help us up level and what, um, you know, entrepreneur organization, which I know you're a part of, uh, how is entrepreneurs organization EO helped you? So, um, first of all, I'm still kind of new, joined a few months ago, so I'm still learning, but over perspective, my learning curve so far has been great. And what I've learned has been amazing. First of all, it's a, it's an amazing group of people. That one of the things that I really like is that they're really there for each other. And whatever you need in any subject, whether it's personal or professional or etc. And I think so at the end of the day, something that is not always easy for people to understand who are not entrepreneurs themselves, who haven't like didn't found something, is that it's not exactly the same role as I think working as a CEO in a company or th something like that, because I think there is a feeling, you know, that that it's on you as the founding member that, and this is why you, you do whatever it takes to make it successful, even sometimes with the price of your personal, um, uh, I would say things. And first of all, it's a group of people that has the same mind share. And you can talk about things that not everyone will understand. So this is amazing. You know, it's uh, <laughs> like some, like going sometimes to, to a treatment and you have the, the pleasure of talking about things and whatever. You have people who you can echo things and they understand you, but can also echo things back that you learn from and adjust and give you more perspectives and things like that. So I think it's a community that really helps to build one another from these relationships and connections. And I've learned a lot just from hearing different people and sometimes very tactical and pragmatic questions. Like, I don't know, I had a question about a specific topic regarding a vendor related to marketing. Should I use it or should I not? What's the benefits and what's not? You know, I send a question out there. Immediately, I get a response. Yes, I have experience. Let's talk. One day later, I have insights that I just couldn't have elsewhere or it would have taking me so much time to get those insights. What's it like your first of all, one last question. Um, before I ask it, I just want to thank you. Thanks for sharing your journey, your experience, lessons. Everyone can check out otorio.com, O-T-O-R-I-O.com to learn more. Uh, Mir, my last question is, you have a young family, kids. Um, talk about what it's like, you know, because we aren't operating companies in a vacuum, right? You have other responsibilities and roles as a as a dad, husband. What's it like managing uh, a company, running a company with um, young kids and family? Um, first of all, I think I'm still figuring it out because I just have a newborn like a few weeks ago. Um, but, uh, and it's my first child, but I think that first of all, um, I, I truly believe that in order to be successful in any aspect of life, first of all, you need to be whole and full with yourself in, in the sense of that you have a happy life, that you live them to the maximum that, that you believe in. And that allows you to thrive in other aspects. And you also need to have this significant, and it's a significant, it's a, it's a joint ride in the roller coaster, right? It's a significant support from home to allow you to do that. Because definitely we're investing a lot of our time, effort, resources in building a company. It's it's like having a, another baby, right? I mean, you build it, you grow it, you there are ups and downs and, and cries and excitement and, and headaches and everything. So you definitely need to have, I think, the supports that's gonna help you do that, that's gonna help you be strong. Because 
I also believe that, you know, um, especially these days, I think uh, building companies, it's not, uh, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And uh, so you need to have uh, good support to allow you to continue because you can break at any time. And there are so many, I don't know, there are, there are milestones that you really think to yourself, what the hell am I doing here? Um, but but I think that what really helps you to continue is that you have your, your support. So, so definitely this is a key thing. And I also think that we need to balance. I also don't believe, you know, um, that uh, there's this thing like uh, everything is critical, so so nothing is critical, right? Uh, you really need to be able to focus. You need, need to be able to differentiate what are the things you that are most impactful. Because I think, again, as I said, it's a marathon. You cannot just continue to run 200% all time. You'll exhaust yourself and it will be just, I think, it, it will impact everyone. The company, the success, to grow everything. You need to be in a, in a happy place to, to be able to, to move forward strongly so i think those are the things and and maybe one critical aspect communication i think what one of the things i've learned is you need to be able to talk about things openly transparently freely in order to you know to to start addressing them and as a team within relationship as a group of people especially if you want to work and be together with someone closely for the long run, you need to be able to feel like you can say everything and solve everything together. Love it. First of all, I want to be the first one to thank you here. Thanks for sharing your journey lessons. Everyone check out otario.com, more episodes of the podcast, and we'll see everyone next time. Thanks, Ayer. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. Like a beach if you find the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand